everybody. How's it going? I am your host, Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC3, Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and get into the cool stuff we found for this episode. Starting off over at Hot Hardware, uh, Apple is rumored to be readying a 12-inch iPad Pro in an attempt to take on Surface Pro 3. This is kind of cool. Well, not really cool, but interesting uh, to say the least. Apple appears to be preparing, at least according to rumors, a two-in-one hybrid tablet convertible that's very much competitive with what uh, Microsoft's Surface Pro line offers, along with countless hybrid tablet notebook convertibles that have custom-built detachable keyboards. Though Johnny Ive gets a little feisty about copycat devices, it's not just flattery, but more specifically theft. It does not seem, it does seem ironic that Apple appears to be lining up Uh, to potentially follow the trend once again rather than lead. So uh, the article points out that the original iPad may have started the tablet revolution in motion, but eventually came the iPad mini. And as Apple caved to the market share success of smaller to seven seven to eight inch devices, um, you know, frankly, I love my iPad. And uh, the only thing I don't like about it is the keyboard, right? It, an iPad about this size, or maybe even a, a slightly larger one, for example, 12-inch display instead of a uh, almost 10-inch display, would be just about perfect for a small and light thing. Uh, you know, if the, if the keyboard was built into the cover or something of that nature, I've always liked Microsoft's uh, tablet slash Surface type computing devices as far as the form factor goes. The operating system, that's another deal altogether. Well, let's not talk about that. But uh, the form factor I've always liked. So if Apple can do something like that with iOS, you know, 8, 8.1, 9, 10, whatever that version uh, may end up being, you know, I think all the more power to them. You know, it's nothing but good for consumers. Yeah, it's a little bit of a copycat-ish type device, but still, you know, it's something that I think that Apple would do very well to uh, sell. Uh, Next up from Beta Wired, Microsoft shows some love to Mac users by announcing a new version of Outlook. I am not an Outlook user on Mac. I cannot stand Outlook on Mac. In fact, generally speaking, I cannot stand Microsoft Office on Mac. So uh, this is pretty interesting. Uh, Microsoft is basically throwing a bone to Mac users with the revelation that it will be rolling out a new version of its Outlook email client for OS X devices. The new version of Outlook, which is a highly popular email client for both, both Mac and PC platform users, boasts better security and performance and improved features in an announcement on Microsoft's official blog. Uh, The company said that the release will offer a more consistent and familiar experience across the Outlook web app for mobile devices, Outlook on the web, and Outlook on the PC and Mac. So I'm curious to see what it's going to look like. I'll definitely be uh, taking a look at it. Um, As far as switching anytime soon, I, I doubt it, especially if I have to spend money to do it. You know, very, very unlikely. From CapitalWired.com, getting to know the big and improved Nexus's line, the Nexus 6. The question that immediately comes to mind is that, uh, is bigger really better? Well, it depends on how you use your device, obviously. When we got to see Google's new flagship, the Nexus 6, equipped with the shiny new Android 5.0 Lollipop operating system, Uh, Well, it's huge compared to its predecessor, and we also are not sure on the size, but it does have its own benefits. The phone doesn't have a firm launch date yet, but Google says it'll become available sometime in November, $649 to $699 unlocked, or for a lower upfront price if bought on contract from a carrier. 
So um, they point out a couple of things to notice right away. Number one, the size, and, and number two, the style and design. Number three, the new version of Android, Lollipop. Uh, so pretty interesting. Um, I've never really been a huge Android user, but uh, still pretty cool nonetheless. From HNGN, Headlines and Global News, Internet Arcade, 900 games are ready to be played in your browser. And boy, they have some awesome ones if this screenshot is to be uh, any indication. According to an article on GameSpot, some 900 classic arcade games are now available for you to play. All you need is a web browser. And if you're reading this piece, you're ready to veg out on some old school arcade goodness. I certainly am. I'm, I've been uh, monkeying around. It's awesome. Uh, they've, th they're all being kept for posterity over at the internet archive. Thanks to the efforts of Jason Scott and those who worked on, uh, JMS or JavaScript mess, a massive emulation project meant to port a multi-platform emulator into a JavaScript language. JS mess has been successful at booting into a wide range of computers. And that left Scott wondering if arcade platforms could be supported. Well, as it turns out, he decided to futz around with the build environment um, just to ask the question and how hard would it be to build arcade, would it be to build arcade games anyway? Turned out to be very easy. Very, very easy. Thank goodness, because I love the old style arcade games. I grew up on those, go down to the local pizza parlor and spend an afternoon and 50 bucks worth of quarters playing arcade games. Awesome stuff. So anyway, um, Definitely check it out. I'm sure I had just ruined the rest of the week's evenings for a whole pile of people. But uh, you know what? That's just how it is sometimes. From uh, the BBC News in the US and Canada, there's uh, some sad news. The Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2, um, they've, they've experienced a crash. The, space, the Virgin Galactic Project is bad, bad news. Um, the news blurb here says that uh, the probe to uh, look into the crash may take upwards of a year. Um, Virgin Galactic would be able to conduct further test flights while the investigation took place. Spaceship 2 broke up midair during a test flight on uh, this past Friday. One of the pilots was killed and the other injured. Virgin Chief uh, Sir Richard Branson says he's determined to find out what went wrong and learn from the tragedy. This is always good news. However, the side effect of this is this is going to set back, you know, uh, the space tourism travel by years and years and years and the privatization of space travel by many, many, many years. So um, it's sad and it's obviously it's sad because, you know, life was lost. Um but at the same time, you know, it's, it's, that's what, sometimes that's what happens when you're, when you're pushing the boundaries. From the inquisitor.com, NASA releases sounds from space on SoundCloud. I included this because I thought it was pretty cool. Um, they ha basically have taken the last half century of sounds uh, and, re and released them on SoundCloud. Uh, it ranges from eerie noises from our solar system to historic moments in space exploration. Um, they have a SoundCloud page that reveals some of the most unusual sounds ever recorded. Definitely go check it out. I thought, you know, some of those, some of you in the audience might find this quite interesting. Now, the next story that we have is kind of a new story, but at the same time, kind of not. Uh, for those of you who may or may not have been pin paying attention, Facebook launched its own dark web site recently, um, basically a, a Tor uh, server and um, hidden service. And the question was asked by this, I can't keep getting these stupid pop-ups. The question was asked by this article over at Wired.com, why? Why did they launch their own dark website? Well, that's a good question. The article starts off, Facebook has never had much of a reputation for letting users hide their identities online, but now the world's least anonymous website has just joined the web's most anonymous network. In a first-of-its-kind move for a Silicon Valley giant, Facebook on Friday launched a Tor hidden service, a version of its website that runs the anonymity software Tor. That new site, which can only be accessed by users running the Tor software, bounces users' connections through 
three extra encrypted hops to random computers around the internet, making it far harder for any network spy observing that traffic to trace their origin. Wow. Inviting users to connect to Facebook over Tor may seem like a strange move, given that Facebook still requires you to log in and doesn't allow pseudonyms in most cases. But even Tor users on the site are hardly anonymous to Facebook itself. So this is really just anonymizing the traffic between yourself and Facebook. But still, nonetheless, you know, the, this raises so many questions. So uh, anyway, I thought this was an interesting article. Definitely check it out. Um, it's, it definitely raises some, some decent questions. Other questions uh, are answered. And, you know, I mean, there are obviously there are reasons for doing such a thing like this. But still, nonetheless, I thought it was interesting. That will do it for this edition of the Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurfing.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. See you then. Bye.